I don't believe any client has sought out crypto exposure. Here's what Larry Fink, CEO of the renowned investment firm BlackRock, had to say back in 2018. A lot has happened since those statements. You may have noticed it was revealed on June 15th that BlackRock submitted a very unique request to the SEC, the watchdog of the U.S. financial markets. This request was for a spot Bitcoin ETF. Well, not exactly, but we'll get back to that. Just as a reminder, or for those who aren't aware, BlackRock is an American firm that's over 30 years old and is an absolute titan. In fact, the titan of asset management. Just to give you an idea, BlackRock employs 18,000 people and manages approximately $10 trillion in assets. Historically, quite hostile towards Bitcoin and cryptos, for technical reasons as well as environmental ones, BlackRock surprised everybody by initiating a file with the SEC for a financial product related to Bitcoin. Here's also what Larry Fink had to say back in 2017. Bitcoin just shows you how much demand for money laundering there is in the world. Look, if I were you, I'd never pay much attention to what these guys say. Instead, watch what they do. We're pretty accustomed to such public statements, while behind the scenes actions tells a totally different story. Take Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, for example. He often bashes Bitcoin in the media, calling it a mere Ponzi scheme, but simultaneously, the bank is making rather encouraging predictions about the top crypto in the market. In short, we just learned a few days ago that the world's largest investment fund, BlackRock, submitted a request last Thursday for what appears to be a spot ETF for Bitcoin, the iShares Bitcoin Trust. This move comes just as some elements within the U.S. administration seem to be gearing up for a war against the crypto ecosystem, or at least those players who've been operating in the industry for years. The timing is rather interesting. Could it be that the SEC and Gensler are trying to clear some space for traditional finance players, the very ones he's worked for and with for 20 years? I'll leave that for you to decide. So does the spot Bitcoin ETF finally stand a chance of getting approved? Should we be excited or scared? We'll try to make sense of all of this in the video. Let's go back to the basics for a moment. An ETF or exchange traded fund is a financial product that replicates the performance of one or several assets. This could be an index like the CAC 40 or the S&P 500, a sector such as renewable energy or the pharmaceutical industry, or even commodities like uranium and oil. If we take an ETF pegged to gold as an example, if gold increases by 10%, then theoretically, the ETF is also supposed to increase by 10%. The same goes the other way around. If gold goes down, the ETF would also go down as well. As the name suggests, these ETFs can be bought or sold on exchanges, basically marketplaces. You purchase these products just like you would buy shares in Apple or Microsoft. The difference is that thanks to these ETFs, you can expose yourself to a much broader array of assets. And you can do this relatively easily and at extremely low cost. For instance, if you wanted to diversify your portfolio with French companies to the max, you could buy every company listed on the CAC 40, but doing that manually would be quite tedious. With an ETF like this one from Lixor, for example, they do all the work for you. The fund buys the underlying assets and handles all the paperwork. By purchasing shares of this ETF, you get exposure to all the companies on the CAC 40. In essence, the principle of an ETF is to act as a wholesaler for you. It buys in bulk and sells in small pieces. As a result, ETFs have much lower fees than you'd get with your individual account of $50,000. Just so you know, there are two types. The ETF with indirect exposure, also sometimes called a synthetic ETF, it uses derivative products like futures or options to replicate the performance of an underlying asset. There's already a Bitcoin ETF of this type available in the US. It broke all records when it launched in 2021. On the other hand, there's an ETF with direct exposure, also known as spot ETF. It's quite simple here. The fund managing the ETF buys and sells the underlying asset or assets. Basically, if one day BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF weighs in at a billion dollars, this would mean that in theory, and I emphasize in theory, that BlackRock holds a billion dollars worth of Bitcoins. In this specific case, Coinbase will handle the custody of the Bitcoin according to the information that we have. Again, for your information, this type of spot ETF already exists for Bitcoin, like the one from Purpose Investment in Canada, but not in the United States. In recent years, these ETFs have become incredibly popular in financial markets due to the ease at which both individuals and professionals can invest in them. You can find these ETFs on almost all popular platforms like DeGiro. So why all the excitement around BlackRock's announcement? Well, several things come into play. First, it shakes up everything that's been said about Bitcoin's environmental impact. BlackRock, and especially its CEO Larry Fink, is known to be extremely concerned about environmental issues. The American Fund favors investments in solutions and companies that ally with ESG requirements. If Bitcoin were as dirty as it's often portrayed, like the New York Times described a few months ago in a completely absurd article, BlackRock would never have dipped its toes in. You can feel the truth starting to surface. 
Now, not everyone will be as optimistic as I am, and some will see this as a strategy by BlackRock to commandeer Satoshi Nakamoto's invention, then change its code by aligning with Greenpeace and the World Economic Forum to switch the network to a proof of stake in a few years. Personally, I'm not buying that theory, but then again, I'll let you form your own opinion. So that was the first significant impact on the environmental narrative. This ETF will also bring significant changes to Bitcoin's accessibility and visibility. Imagine if you are a producer, let's say of strawberry jam, and out of the blue, Walmart decides to stock your product on their shelves. Well, Bitcoin is a strawberry jam, and Walmart is the New York Stock Exchange. On top of that, you can slap a label on your jar saying, voted best strawberry jam of the year, 2023. That's BlackRock's seal of approval. A Bitcoin ETF would allow millions of professionals and individuals to easily invest in Bitcoin without necessarily changing their habits, and most importantly, without having to hold actual Bitcoins on their balance sheet. This means no need to open an account on a crypto exchange, like our partners Paymium on GA Crypto, or bother about what a private key or public address is. I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying that an ETF would considerably simplify the investment process. Keep in mind that many organizations are not allowed to hold Bitcoin either, due to law or their internal regulation. If I'm not mistaken, the very first proposal to launch a similar product was submitted in July 2013 by the Winklevoss brothers, famous for the lawsuit against Mark Zuckerberg. Until now, every attempt to launch an ETF has been halted by the SEC. Now, there's another type of financial product that's somewhat similar, the trust. And that's the structure BlackRock has chosen in this case. A trust is a legal entity tasked with holding an asset on behalf of its clients. This entity is divided into shares, and each client holds a number of shares equivalent to the amount of money they have in the trust. This is the format of the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, the famous GBTC. In other words, the fund's clients essentially own a portion of the Bitcoin held by Grayscale. At first glance, it seems that there's not much difference between a trust and a spot ETF. After all, both are tasked with holding assets for their clients. Mm, yes and no. The subtle but fundamental difference between the two is that an ETF can create and destroy fund shares based on market demand, thus more accurately tracking the price of the underlying asset. This is what's known as the creation redemption mechanism. That's the magic sauce of the ETF. We have what are called authorized participants, or APs, essentially card-carrying investors like market makers or large financial institutions that will serve as intermediaries between the ETF and the secondary market, and who will conduct arbitrage operations each time the fund starts to trade at a premium or discount. One important detail is that a trust has a much higher management fee than an ETF. In the case of GBTC, Grayscale pockets 2% per year of the trust's value annually. A standard ETF would be 10 times less expensive. But let's get back to BlackRock. To be really precise, they in fact filed an application for the formation of a trust and not a Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, I know it's getting confusing. Actually, it's a somewhat unique trust. In the document submitted by BlackRock, we can see that shares can be created and redeemed in batches of 40,000. And most importantly, they can be redeemed in exchange for actual Bitcoin. We also learn that the shares will be listed and traded on the NASDAQ, which is, as you know, the second largest stock market in the US. So yes, BlackRock's product is not strictly speaking an ETF, but it will function exactly like an ETF. So it's sort of an ETF after all. Some have pointed out that this type of model is rather common for ETFs related to commodities. Eric Balkinus, an ETF analyst at Bloomberg, gives the SPDR gold shares as an example, which is the largest gold-related trust with a similar structure to the one that BlackRock just submitted to the SEC, and which trades like an ETF. As Will Rind, the former head of GLD ETF we mentioned, explains, this structure is much more suited to commodities. For the record, of the 576 ETF applications filed by BlackRock, only one has been rejected by the SEC over transparency issues, and that was in 2014. If anyone can get a spot Bitcoin ETF approved, it's BlackRock. In any case, it's clear that this application was well thought out and they understand their chances of success. The effects of the announcement were immediate. Within a week, six additional Bitcoin ETF applications were filed with the SEC. Nobody wants to be left behind, so all the giants of traditional finance are falling in line behind BlackRock. They don't want to miss out on this opportunity. But what are the risks? Firstly, rehypothecation. Remember, I initially told you that if BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF weighed $1 billion, they should keep $1 billion worth of Bitcoin in reserve at Coinbase. Well, not exactly. Generally, these large investment funds don't let their assets sit idle. They lend them out. This is the notorious rehypothecation. So if you have people thinking you're buying Bitcoin by investing in BlackRock's spot ETF, when in reality, there may not necessarily be actual Bitcoin backing it. Now, I wasn't able to confirm that this is what BlackRock's intent is, but the risk exists, and this would affect the practical supply of Bitcoin in circulation. We refer to these as paper Bitcoins. This section of BlackRock's application also generated a lot of buzz. It discusses a Bitcoin fork, and it states that in the event of a chain split, 
Like the one in 2017 between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, BlackRock reserves a right to decide which is a valid chain, and by default, what is considered the real Bitcoin. There have been plenty of reactions on Twitter about these few sentences. And in fact, if these traditional finance actors like BlackRock accumulate a substantial quantity of Bitcoin, they will start to wield increasing influence on Bitcoin's consensus landscape, especially if the American mining industry and the world's largest trading platforms align with their cause. In that case, we can in fact see Bitcoin becoming captured, if you will. And I stress one Bitcoin, meaning these players will have one network, one specific chain. Nothing will prevent users, if they wish, from operating on a parallel version and considering their Bitcoin as real Bitcoin exactly as Bitcoin Cash supporters today consider their Bitcoin as authentic. In short, whether we want it or not won't change much. The arrival of traditional finance in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is only a matter of time. This will undoubtedly create a new form of demand for Bitcoin. As you can see on this chart, the price of gold surged when the first spot ETF was launched in early 2000s. In just 10 years, the price of gold increased fivefold. Now at the same time, let's not forget, there was also one of the biggest financial crises in history. But fundamentally, ETFs make an asset more accessible, and that automatically creates a buying pressure. Combined with the limited or even very limited supply to that of Bitcoin, you get an explosive cocktail. For your information, if we look at on-chain data, we see that about 70% of the circulating Bitcoin supply hasn't moved over a year. We're at historic levels. Who would have thought 14 years ago that Bitcoin would gradually infiltrate the heart of traditional finance? It's become evident that Satoshi Nakamoto's invention is not simply a fluke or a passing fad, but a deep disruptive force that's transforming the very foundations of global finance. The gradual arrival of institutions and traditional finance into the Bitcoin universe is a tangible sign of increasing acceptance of this disruptive technology. Funnily enough, even Credit Agricole, whose CEO Philippe Brassac not long ago predicted Bitcoin would drop below $1, has just turned PSAN in France. Proves that only fools never change their minds. Bitcoin's story is unfolding before our eyes. It's essential to stay vigilant. Avoid being naive without being completely paranoid either. The future of the project will depend on how well we preserve its original essence while avoiding the pitfalls of centralization and manipulation that could compromise the initial promise. And what if, in the end, these Wall Street dinosaurs were caught in their own game, believing they could control and monopolize a creature, when in fact, it could blow them up from the inside? Does that remind you of something?